If the original article I had written about the most common used CDs took into account the rest of world, or if I knew anything about it, like, yeah, White Ladder would be an ash. We talked about 1977 last time. White Ladder would be way up there, and it's a great record. But the thing is, is, like, he's got, like, four greatest hits collections. So, do, I mean, look, I mean, it is the, I think it's the one of two albums he did that are strong enough, like, to be worth owning on their own, particularly if you're talking charity shop and it's, like, two ninety nine. I, I think that's worth it. Um, so... Yeah, um, it's it's a record I love. I, it's you know, White Ladder's got a pre-gap track. Yeah, that's another uh, CD phenomenon staple is messing with the indexing and in tracks. So every track has a well, the beginning of a CD has a two-second buffer. Like that's machined in in the Red Book. You have to have that. And that's another thing about us doing a record label now is like I forgot you know making DDPs and all the technical stuff with CDs has been fun to get back into, but. You can do that on any track. Any track can have a two second, um, has a two second lead in if you let it play naturally in the old world. And what some bands did is they'd hide stuff in it. So the Lemonheads have a whole song that only exists if you go to like track six on um, Come On Feel the Lemonheads and hit the rewind button on the CD. My CD player doesn't have a, a jog rewind, it only has track to track. So I can't even get it. But yeah, if you rewind in the indexing, there's a there's an entire song or stupid thing in there. You know, it's like um, bands used to, you know, want to put songs on track 69 on their CD. And, you know, Mercury Rev famously did this on um, on uh, Your Self-Esteem, I believe. It goes all the way up to the, the highest track, which is 99. And that's where Chase, uh, Car Wash Hair, rather, is. Nine Inch Nails did it. Obviously, I'm sure Marilyn Manson did it. I don't even freaking know, but... Anyway, um, yeah, Christmas music, $50 card. Yeah, that's easy. I mean, dying for themes. That's, we're going to uh, table that. That will definitely go off. We're going to need uh, themes. I mean, this, the, the intention with this is to make this be like a, a bang it out one hour. I'm going to show you like a, a sort of technique that I always use to identify what might be a good store um, and just blow through, you know, some CDs and that'll be it. On the screen, I have the most expensive sales. This is also something we should probably like goof on because, you know, it's literally going to be 20 years ago shortly, <laughs> shortly, but 15 years ago, I, I was doing a blog after I left Pitchfork called Shallow Rewards and it was about overpriced and stupid crazy sales on ebay that's what i started out writing about um really i mean in the blog era and like oh three oh four that's you know when we all started doing that independently and um there's actually an, an ebook on amazon for that shallow reward stuff um you i i don't even know if i'm charging for it i haven't looked at it in so long but it's a it's a epub i made myself <laughs> um and it's been out there forever but it's got a whole bunch of the the pages from that blog, which like you can go into archive.org on the internet and look it up if you want to, whatever. Um, been trying the, the method for the Cocteau twins, found some sellers, haven't pulled the trigger. Yeah, um, it's tough, you know. Um, Follow the leader has 12 tracks of silence. Yeah, all that crap, they, they, it's so silly. Um, so yeah, Bohemian Rhapsody. So, I mean, so I used to track this kind of thing as a way to give me a topic to write about. That was the whole problem. Like, you get it, like, what, why would I continue writing? And it, like, what would inspire me to write? And so I would, I would track eBay auctions of stuff, and I had all these crazy filters and searches. Oh yeah, a Harvey Danger record on Universal Special Markets, a repress is going for sold for two hundred sixty dollars. That's got to be someone in the band. Um, you know, uh, this must have been in really good nick. Get the lamb, 2LP. Oh, it was the 01. Genesis people are crazy. Like, they're they're big about which remaster they're getting. So, like, the 01 stuff, that's not... I don't know what, what master that is. That's, that's a really weird one. Um, they're not sick, but they're not well. Very good. <coughs> anyway. So, um, yeah, finding, uh, what's, what's a, me what's a method that, uh, yeah, they're getting caught editing their own wiki article, buying their rare, uh, you know, whatever. Um, so 
like what's a way to get, find a good store really quick? One of the things I do all the time when I'm trying to figure out what a good store would be is look for something relatively obscure and like, look, I'm, you know, look at, I'm totally like a typical underground rock, post-punk, whatever person, goth, all that shit. Like, you know, I've got a wide variety of music I enjoy and stuff, but in terms of the collecting and the CD thing, it's really about like, when you look at CDs and when they were dominant and you know, where the value is, it does track pretty heavily with the time period. So one of the things that can really help is if you find something relatively obscure, but then you find it's in a, it's in a store that's pretty big because it means like, they're not just a warehouse with a bunch of, you know, REM monster CDs and, you know, U2's disco tech or whatever, like all the basic stuff. Like, sure, the basic stuff is great because that's where you can get an enormous haul for of like 80 CDs for 120 bucks shipped or something stupid. You know what I mean? That's great. But like a lot of that is strictly collecting. A lot of that is building your, you know, physical catalog of CDs for yourself to have your little, you know, library or whatever. When, when you're talking about stuff you would actually want, stuff that's actually great, it's much harder um, to get a, you know, to get a bag out of one store and identify a store that's going to have, you know, a bunch of great stuff. One of the things I do, which we'll do now, um, is look for something, you know, obscure and underground from like 85 to 95, let's say. Um, What's a good artist? Like, and some of them aren't obscure enough to be a good, in, uh, let's do, let's, all right, I'm going to do Bitch Magnet. So this was the band before Seam, um, Su Young Park was in, and they have, this, this album here has been reissued a bunch of times, and there's like a box set now with all three of them. Uh, Ben-Hur, this album's phenomenally good. Uh, I mean, whatever, like, Albini produced it. He didn't really produce it. He cleaned it up and he kind of mocked it at the t Well, he mocks everything, but he, you know, it's like, it's a college band. Like it, you know, Slint is sort of like kids, you know, like despite how good they were. And Ben Hur is like significantly shakier, um, especially on the early records than, you know, Seam was later. Cause you get, you end up getting like Brad Wood and other people in there and they're getting better over time as players. So, um, like Ben Hur isn't even really like a good record to choose because it's pretty star booty. Right, let's pick star booty. So forty three copies of this for sale, probably mostly vinyl. Uh, U.S. only eleven. This is gonna be tough. All right, and it's all vinyl, but that's okay. Uh, we got eleven copies of this record on vinyl. Stores that are gonna have this, you know, if they're or if they're big. So right here, here's a store. Uh, uh, I don't know. They're asking high side, but clearly lots of ratings. These are big stores, so we can take a look and see what they've got. And one of the cool things, here's another one. One of the cool things that can happen is, you know, like why would a big store stock something like this? It's just an indication that they tend to have, you know, good stock. Um, yeah, no, a lot of people didn't. I, I mean, you talk about bands that got no profile, no press, never... Like, yeah, Bitch Magnet really was way under the radar. I mean, it's like, you know, the bands that people were in before they formed Chavez and stuff, like, you know, the Chaves. Um, so, like, this is, there's an absolutely crazy, that's, like, 27,000 ratings on this. That's nuts. But, like, here you can see this is probably a personal seller. Um, not a great target for value buy. You know, these are, these are probably personal sellers. But, like, you know, you could go in there and every record is just going to be some amazing you know, like it's probably like they've got 20, yeah, 81. Yeah. Like, and it's all like completely sick, you know, edge, like killer seven inches underground shit, you know, like, but you know, you knew what this was going to be like, this is this, this person's got like a great bundle of, of good shit that, that like a head would want to pick up. But when we're talking about buying for value and buying UCDs, that's not really a great target. Downtown Music Gallery. Okay, so right off the top, this is probably a big, yeah, they're selling everything at list. So this is not, right, like you're getting, this is literally going to a record store. Sealed copy of Pentastar, 15 bucks, you know, on Sub Pop, great. But we're not here to shop retail. Um, so I'm going to rule that one out. That's a non-starter. Uh, Noise in Your Head, I've seen this store many times. Um, also, uh, very high ticket stuff in, in many cases and heavily, yeah, 
So this is monster vinyl. They barely have any CDs. Now that could work to your advantage potentially, but it's probably going to be high ticket, you know, stuff and box sets. Um, mm, a couple things, but nothing's jumping out at me. Um, yeah, definitely not jumping out at me. Preston School of Industry. Woof. Uh, yeah, this isn't really. The prices are okay, but they're not great. Um, Anna Music 2. Tons of ratings. What do we got? Another one that's massively vinyl focused, and that's that's fine. Um, what kind of CDs do they have? What prices are they, more importantly? Because we're not going to get a bag out of, like... You know, paying eight bucks, two ninety nine, three ninety nine, fifty bucks for the bedhead numero box. That ain't bad. I mean, nothing, no box set is really ever going to be great in terms of what people ask for them. But it's the CD version. I mean, you know, not to bag on numero too much, but the vinyl of this was a disaster. The holes were offset wrong, so like literally brand new out of the box, the vinyl would like skip, and people had warped copies. Like it was just they went to the wrong plant. Something went wrong with the vinyl box set for Bedhead on Numero, and it was very loudly and publicly um, slammed. I don't understand. I mean, look, Bedhead was a seven-inch band. You know, I mean, I I have what Fun Life was on Von Twelve Inch because it's a beautiful object and it was one of my favorite records in the '90s. And but I've got all the original seven inches because that's really where on vinyl, you know, Bedhead was interesting. You had the Dark Ages EP, um, but all this stuff was on CD at the same time. Trans Syndicate was putting it out on CD EPs and stuff. Um, and so you know, it, it's. I, I, you know, there's no way I would, I would definitely say Bedhead is a CD band. I mean, that's, we, you know, that's what they were out on. That's what I was listening to them on at the time, at the time. And, um, you know, this box set's got all their stuff. I, personally, I don't like the box set. You can still get Bedhead's original material for not that much money. Um, and I would say if you were interested in them, just like go collect the seven inches as you're going, you know, and, um, and, uh, because they've you know they've got good art they've got good presence good text etc but um so that's not bad what else do they have suzanne vega's nine objects of desire that's that's a little after where i would go with her the hissy fits <laughs> 399 uh i don't know oh yeah there you go peter gabriel so that's an all-timer um I mean, that's, that's a no brainer. I'm, if you don't have that, it's just everywhere. It's, it's not a problem. Um, Ken Shipley's going to be pissed. The new Box is going for under 50. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> so is a vinyl all timer. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's eighties, but it, I, I actually disagree. Um, so is right when CD takes off, like the big CDs I think about that were, early CDs that remind me of CD becoming a real thing. So is absolutely one of them. Another would be like in excess is kick. Um, the police, the police's greatest hits from 86. That's another one where I think about like CDs being a thing. Um, oh, a tooth and nail sampler. All right. Lollapalooza 93 comp. Yeah, we could stay. There's some interesting stuff here. So this is Sony. So this is going to be all the, I'm guessing all the Sony bands and Columbia and stuff. Yeah, Dinosaur Jr. going home. That was the song off that record, too. I mean, in a way, it was one of the three or four best ones. He's my thing, babes. This was this Lollapalooza was the last. No, it was the second. I went to the this one in 94 and then I stopped going because it just got stupid. Um, isn't so the moment CD mastering was finally done properly. Yeah, it's one of the first one of the first CDs that was really mastered to the potential. Uh, Peter Gabriel, so of the format for sure. It, it's, I mean, it's not, you know, brick wall, but uh, Brothers in Arms is another one right around that time. Yep, absolutely. That Dire Straits, brother, brothers, brothers in Arms. Um, the man's too big, the man's too strong. Um, <laughs> yeah, they, um, that record's fidelity is unbelievable. Uh, so Far Away on that album is one of my favorite songs ever. Like, it's so bizarre. It's like out of tune. The guitar effects are crazy. I've talked about it before, probably in live streams. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if you could really put something together from here. Best of Buffalo Springfield for $3.99 on Echo. That's not bad. Vans Warp Tour. 
Oh, they might be Giants Flood and John Henry. Ah, this isn't bad. Well, we can we can stick around here. So you got so you get the best of the you get the best of Culture Club. You know, I, I Culture Club is such a the, the first two Culture Club records are so phenomenal front to back. Um, I I just I can't recommend it strongly enough. My collection of memorabilia is pretty nuts, actually. I've got all kinds of weird uh, little Culture Club things like this completely awesome little pin um, and little things like that. And, and I have the picture disc of, of Color by Numbers and the VHS of, of A Kiss by the Ocean and all this stuff. Um, I'm a huge fan. I'm a huge fan of Boy George. I, I've, I did a two-part video on the old Shallow Rewards videos about him and about that moment you know that that he had and and that the band had and if you haven't read um his his book he has like three but the first one i think is called boy it's phenomenal you really want to get it like it's just the right blend of honesty personal narrative and like dish um so yeah boy George, is the craftwork cd box worth it no not in my view um one the last two or three records sucked. And also the mastering is really hotly debated. Um, I would definitely not, if you're talking about what's it called, like the 3D something, um, the 3D project or something. I remember what you're talking about. It was a really big deal that Kraftwerk was getting a box set and all that. But I, to me, I, I don't, their catalog is not, you know, um, you know, it's not all great to me. I'm not like diehard crazy for them. I'm not diehard crazy for any band. Every band has bad shit. Can has crap records. Everyone does. Like, you know, unless you broke up after the third album, they were all good. Like, you know, Noi pretty much did that. Um, Numero Group is going to be really busy. Yeah, they're going to definitely be doing, like I talked about it in the last stream, they're going to have a whole bunch of 90s alt because it's just blowing up for them and they have better bands out there. I'm a celeb is big, but we can't get it. No, we don't get, I mean, BB, you can get BBC Britbox and there's ways to get it, but I'm a celeb in terms of like being a cultural, it's like the Bake Off or, you know, QI or whatever, all that Oxbridge shit. None of that stuff is over here except for Anglophile idiots like me. I mean, you know, like I, that's, <laughs> that's me. Like I, you know, I, I fall asleep to travel man <laughs> with like, you know, Iwate and Mel like drinking chartreuse. But that's me. Anyway, this is an interesting store. We're seeing some interesting stuff. Um, uh, oh, wow. Weird. So Buffalo Springfield is a, is a weird one. If, you, if you're into old, like, head, hippie, proto stuff. Um, what do we got? For what it's worth. So now I think I love you. Uh, Clancy can't even sing. And expecting to fly. Yeah, this is kind of short. I mean, uh, there, there's better comps. This was a very early Atco cash-in. There's better ways to get it. Um, yeah, Top Gear. Top Gear is massive in America. That's true. Uh, that, that blew through. You'll ride or die for Electric Cafe. All right, that's cool. No harm, no foul. Uh, what Vino am I enjoying? Uh, it's dog shit, table one. Uh, so they might be Giants Flood, sorry. They Might Be Giants has got a two CD set called, I think it's called like Then or something. Um, or Back Then, I, what, the, what the hell is it called? I'll just pull them up. Um, it's a compilation of the first two albums from 86 and 88. Um, what the hell? Then, the earlier years, this is it. So Restless was their original label. In the first stream you saw I was wearing an Anna Ng shirt that we produce. We have a store linked in the Twitter account for the record label Mutual Skies, which through Amazon is printing on demand designs that we put up. You can get the old Carl's genre shirt and some other shit. And we got some stuff in there quick, but I, we haven't really added anything to it in a bit. But yeah, if you look in, if you look in uh, the Twitter bio, you'll see it. Anyway, this if you can get this for this kind of money, man, it is such a great compilation because you're getting all the B-sides and EPs that, and bonus track, you know, all this stuff that was around, floating around these albums. Um, there, you know, they had a they had an EP, you know, around the same time as they might be, and this is like their early, like weird novelty kind of stuff. But Lincoln is just so good, and and especially the the B-sides and the EPs that were around it. So I mean. This thing sews up everything right up to flood. 
um, if you're interested in this band. And then um, Flood, which you see here for two ninety nine, was really their their crossover big one because of this novelty song Istanbul, not Constantinople, but also this really beautiful pop song called Birdhouse in Your Soul, which I absolutely love. Um, there are some really funny stuff, and like it wasn't just Istanbul; it was this one, Particle Man. This was like an a, an actual legitimate novelty nerd rock MTV alt, you know, quirky person hit. Um, so this is one, you know, if, if this was going to be a Target store for two ninety nine, dollars absolutely. Flood is a great own. Um, and I mean, look, I'm not like a huge, yeah, Tiny Toons music. It's totally a goof. Um, I mean, this isn't like serious music, but they're such a unique band. I think you have to respect it. Um, you know, for me, having a bunch of kids, when they started doing the children's music, they're the band that started that. They're the band that made totally unique original content for children it's like educational and fun and awesome i love those dvds the abcs and the one two threes like we burn those down you can't even they're like ruined i'd have to buy them again if i wanted to watch them but um yeah i have i have a ton of respect for that band i i mean yeah i, I bagged on them when i was a kid when i was like you know mr goth serious i don't nobody could be funny in music this isn't cool you know, because I mean, I, like, I grew up with Dr. Demento and like legit like fish heads and shit novelty and Weird Al. So, I mean, they weren't that clearly. Um, and they had really good songwriting chops. Birdhouse in Your Soul is sick. I mean, I'm, I'm sure people have covered it, but if they haven't, there are so many like sort of um, ang anxious, nervy, quirky, they might be giant songs that are actually brilliantly written and would make phenomenal straight covers. Um, if you're going to look into it, unforgettable fire. Yeah. Pff, desire by you two coming at you. I mean, this is a must Two ninety two fifty. bad. Come on. This has got, this is, I mean, this is like, it's as, I think it's as good as Joshua tree in many respects. Two forty nine. Get it. Come on. Peak you too. I agree. And Connor would know. Um, Whitney's debut. Oh man, that cover. Uh, I could read lots of hot takes about <laughs> the cultural insensitivity or sensitivity of that cover, man. And Ar Arista Records is just the darkest story, man. This label, I like dedicated Arista Chrysalis. There are so many labels like this that were f like formed during the peak of profitability for music that are so like awesomely sketchy and messed up but you know i this is you know you're gonna get you're gonna get some good stuff in here obviously one of the most classic ballads of all time i had to sing this in school choir um and of course you know how will i know so i mean saving all my love for you i can't even that song makes my hair fall out oh my god um we had a guy who redid tmbg on casio's Oh, cool. Yeah, I mean, you kind of can't mess those songs up. Octung Baby, we were talking about this in the last stream. This is going to be the Jewel Case edition. Uh, yeah, see, there you go. Oh, it's so ugly. The Island Spine is just the worst. Columbia's is better, for God's sake. The epic red on uh, Columbia stuff is preferable to this. It's so hideous. But So this is not the version you want of this. But if you strictly just want the album and the music on it, okay but there's a gorgeous you know infamous gorgeous um fold out i mean one of the early you know creative digipack productions that broke with just you know being a fold out um the the digit track i guess they're calling it that's weird but yeah this this is the way to own this for sure it's this big fold out and they all fall apart and they're all screwed up i have like three of them in various states of of uh you know physical quality but I mean, absolute stone classic record. Just, I mean, it's so strong front to back. I mean, unless like Bono's, you know, uh, voice makes your skin crawl, which is possible. If you have any patience at all for their whole style and their whole Eno period, um, which, you know, ends up getting cloned for Coldplay, um, this was the peak of that. It's got experiment. I mean, this is their Milo Zyloto or Milo Zyloto is Coldplay's Octung Baby. Um, and it's, it was, you know, everybody that's in here knows that's one of my favorite records of the last like 20 years. Um, the Nuggets single CD, this is a weird one. Rhino did this way back in 86. I think this, this predates the box. This is supposed to be like the initial one LP version released on CD. Um, 
obviously it's not the complete article, but for four ninety for three ninety for four bucks, you know, if you were gonna make a card here, um, and you aren't familiar with nuggets and you aren't familiar with these, these are like the big ones. Count five seeds, like these the standells pick on me. Like these are the big, big cuts from this whole nuggets thing that went on for, you know, decades and, and is one of the big collector strains. It's overdone. I mean yeah, the original iteration is just those. It's the single LP. The box was 93. There you go. Um, yeah, I mean, if you, you know, Children of Nuggets was what? It was the late, late 90s. That that was too much. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, Nuggets as a series is legendary. You know, it's like the American Encyclopedia of Folk or whatever the hell that was called. I mean, it's really important. Um you know, preservation type thing. And this is the, like I was saying, the CD of the original single LP. Um, what else do we got here? Tokyo Police Club. Get your, uh, get your mall emo on. In Spiral Carpets. Oh, talk about uh, landfill artists over in the UK. This is from 94. Wow. Oh, brutal. So you can see here I have two of these just because literally the reason I got these, like they were a dollar and it's just because of the cover. Like it's just to physically have and hold the cover because the, um, the I mean, um, Americans of a certain age are not going to know this band had a massive breakthrough hit. It's a ballad called This Is How It Feels. And it has like a, a, a you know, a 60s organ kind of sound that it, it became one of these emotional, like, uh, you know, football pitch you know, like the Stone Roses, um, you know, they're the theme, the unofficial theme of Man United. And, you know, I don't know if a club uses this. I'm going to look over here. Yeah, they do suck, but this is how it feels. It's like there's another band called That Petrol Emotion. Right around this time had a song called Cellophane that similarly was a ballad. And it was really cool and original. And it called back to the 60s, which was still not cool. I mean, there was kind of a Jerry Bear revival in the late 80s, but like, I don't know. Anyway, this is how it feels. And that petrol emotion cellophane are like really twinned for me as one hit wonders from this period that were pretty original. But um, oh, there's an interesting comment in the chat. It's, that's true. It's literally the police song Invisible Sun with different lyrics. I mean, it's also a really different presentation. But anyway, these guys um, were such also rans during Baggy. I mean, they were bigger than like, you know, uh, what the hell were they called? Um, Northern, um, what was that band with the, with the plum on the cover? North side. <laughs> Fuck. Um, but you know, again, the baggy, I, you know, the baggy dance pop period is really, is really interesting and, and funny, but this is not something you want to buy. <laughs> this is after they had any even recognizable, uh, relevance to anything. Michael Jackson's bad. Recommend getting the OG CD on this. You do not want remasters of MJ shit. It's all way too hot. It's way, way too punchy. Um, you need the headroom on this because bad's like all MIDI and records like this dance pop late eighties records like Janet's rhythm nation, 1814 from 90. Um, all these records, you got to get the original CDs because they, it's, it's part of their sound that they had such a low noise ceiling. And, you know, when that gets blown out by remastering, AKA, you know, exciting and compression and all the crap they do, um, awful, it just ruins it. And so anyway, you know, if, if you don't have bad, um, I mean, th literally the, the goal of bad, which is why you see 7,000 credits per song was for every song to be a number one single. That was their explicit intention. They wanted every single song on this album to go to number one. Obviously speed demon didn't make it. Um, but like it, it's monstrous how big this record was. It wouldn't stop. I mean, by the time Leave Me Alone came out, I think it was like 92. I mean, I'm kidding, but it was just this record went from 87 straight into 90 nonstop. Like they weren't even it was totally unprecedented. They weren't even pretending that there was an album cycle coming after this. It was like this is going to take two full years of singles of big six month singles like bad for six months, the way you make me feel for six months, you know, uh, another part of me for three months, man in the mirror forever. Um, I just can't stop loving you. Dirty Diana, smooth criminal. I mean, are you kidding me? It's ridiculous. Um, what's my best soundboard option for bad. <laughs> I forgot about it again, man. Oh, geez. 70 bucks. I gotta get better on that. Blues. 
Get and the boys around. It too. Have a I good didn't night. Even have it set up right. Um. Anyway, Fatima Mansions. That was interesting. They were around for a while. I won't get into that. So, Queens of the Stone Age would go with the flow. What do we got? No one. This is the song. Man, tag this, get it. I'd pay five. I'd pay ten for this. So the, I, I, anybody on the that's been around knows I love this. Uncle's remix and no one knows is one of my favorite kind of you know chop up collage, um, you know post DJ shadow kind of things that's been done. And this is the radio edit too, which is killer. For four ninety nine, I would absolutely get this to get that song. There's other places you can get it. There's a longer mix of it, but yeah. Um, well, there, yeah, you should be able to get these guys for nothing. I'm just not sure offhand where else this song is. So for me, I would consider taking that down to get that song on CD. Love it. Um, yeah, Never Neverland was big, big album. Um, anyway, uh, what else do we got here? Six Press. <laughs> oh man, yep. This is some, this is some seriously uh, vintage. <laughs> Find them, fool them, forget them. You know it. Um, and w oh, was nothing was nothing to lose on this too? No, they added it. They must have added it because this. I think that was a standalone twelve inch. But anyway, the six forty five version. Okay, yeah. All right. Well, interesting. I mean, honestly, these are some uh, these are some some classic jams from the uh, the transition out of energy into into like straight up mainstream house and shit. Um, uh, what else? Ah, there's Cosmic Thing again. Total repeat offender. It's the right price too, two fifty. Um, Duran's greatest. Uh, I mean, you gotta, you gotta get it because there's so many non-album singles and mixes. You need this Shep Pettibone mix of "I Don't Want Your Love." You need the forty-five edit of "All She Wants Is." Like, yeah, you gotta get this. I mean, the cover sucks, and it, it's it's annoying being industrial kind of greatest hit shit. But um, the single version of Ordinary World too, because that album version is just interminable. Um, all these edits, these single edits, are just such the superior article. And in, in, I mean, uh, I totally you know, and you get View to a Kill too, and the Reflex. These are standalones. I mean, awesome. It's just, a, I mean, it's a no brainer. You got to get that. Um, I never buy CD singles because of how much space is on the CD. <laughs> it's dumb. Well, I mean, those were the days. I mean, that's that sort of tells that, that kind of gives the lie, right? That's such a tell on the music industry. Like they'd open, they're they're selling you the music, not the medium. They you're paying five ninety nine for a CD single and and fourteen ninety nine for a full length album. That's literally the exact same object. It just contains less music. It's silly, they're, you know. But that nobody like nobody thought much about that at the time. Um, ugh, not a Wilco fan. Um, oh, bad too. Talk about like pre Nirvana dance pop. This is the one. So this has um, this is not a good album. But Rush and the Globe were the big uh, Mick Jones from the Clash sample dance pop songs. They're awesome, but. They have a greatest hits you can get for a dollar. Uh, hold out for the greatest hits because then you get some stuff from the early sort of legit records like Number Ten Upping Street, where they're doing like you know super super eighty five eighty six uh, influenced by Detroit a little bit. But like he's they've got really good he's got a really good um, producer and DJ on that early stuff. So to get the blend of it, you'd want to hold out for the greatest hits because this album absolutely sucks apart from the two singles and. I think they're like, yeah, it's like a six minute slog of version of the globe. So that's a no. Um, but I mean, you're definitely coming out of the store with a bag. Yeah, the bad late Perubu, Tim Kerr period. No, Vic Chestnut fans could get that. Ryan Adams. Uh, yeah, you'll be able to get his discography on um, cheap for a long time. Oh, the Duran singles box is, is sick with the night versions. Yeah. Doesn't that also have the mix or did they do the mix separately? Cause they used to, you know, they did a mix of like the songs they used to play, you know, maybe at the rum runner, the club that they were out of in Birmingham. And, uh, it was really good. It's got a lot of good shit on it. They should be paying me to take Ryan Adams CDs. Come on. I mean, look, uh, 
there's there's like three good ones, right? He had three good records. I mean, Heartbreaker Gold, no, two. Some people, I remember, no, some didn't some people like rock and roll? I can't remember. I mean, Heartbreaker and Gold are good records, whatever. I didn't get into that bullshit. Um, <laughs> but yeah, this one is when he was doing the Cardinals or something, right? Or, or what was he doing? Um, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm loudly not a Wilco fan. It's a rap, baby. Uh, unfortunately, this isn't their really, really good stuff. Um, Kick It is the only real banger on this. Um, I think it's In Decline is okay, but they were so done by this point. Um, this, this band, though, I absolutely love them. Um, it, you know, they fell off really with the album even before this, Ebhead, but... Uh, great. They were like a, you know, continuity from, from kind of DAF, um, and what they called EBM electronic body music coming out of Germany in the early eighties. Um, they were like the dominant, like Teutonic industrial band, uh, Leibach and, and Nitzreb and, and a couple others. They, I mean, like ministries like sleazy, it's got a lot of Rob Zombie and Dracula, you know what I mean? Like, there's a lot of like sleaze and Black Sabbath and sludge to ministry, despite how insanely tight and fast and technical it is. It just not a lot of ministry, especially after um, once you get to land of, of rape and honey is like it doesn't have the space. It doesn't have the, the really grating, punishing drum machines. That period he was doing more like the really, you know, cheesy goth stuff. Um, and then Twitch is where, he, you know, he kind of breaks with it and he's right in that kind of industrial spot. But he. He goes, you know, guitar onslaught in a way that Nitzrab never did. They stayed totally electro and harsh as hell. Um, cheap, che oh, best of bow wow, wow, wow six ninety nine. Come on, that hurts. Oh, but this is the really big one that has her solo stuff too. When she did Fever, this has got everything. Uh, go wild in the country, C thirty sixty ninety go. These are classics. I mean, obviously the cover I Want Candy made them famous, but they have really good jams for uh, for ages. Elimination Dancing, absolute monster classic. Aphrodisiac is good too. 699 is a little rich, but um, yeah, because it's the long one, it's probably worth it. I mean, I they're they're a, they are a greatest hits band. I mean, look, there's like yes, there's this whole cool story of Malcolm McLaren and how this was his project after the Sex Pistols and he stole Adamant's band and made them bow wow wow and like there's lots of intrigue and there were great songs because it was this big like he's doing duck rock there's this whole collaborative thing happening with lots of different people in malcolm's universe and bow wow wow you know definitely benefited from that i mean you got like the marco peronis of the world and and uh, adam himself ah we got two peter gabriel like da major dad tears records here we got so back up top and now you get us this is the ultimate dad tier record um and i don't mean tear i mean tear um this this is like uh had a bunch of divorces i'm banging sinead o'connor and like it's, this period is so emo it's fucking awesome like he's so like like old to be doing pop music you look at the video for uh such a fucking good song digging in the dirt i mean this shit is so original this album is so heavy and good like fucking secret world the the fretless bass on it um the song love to be loved literally i cry every time i hear it like yeah i'm wearing new balance sneakers bawling every time i hear it and and come talk to me too like this is divorce rock non pareil no one has written a divorce rock concept album as powerful as us it's a must fucking own it's one of the best productions you'll ever hear because it's real world right he's in the middle of doing passion the soundtrack to last temptation of the christ and working with all these incredible musicians from all over africa and everywhere else in the goddamn world and i mean just there's nothing that sounds like this record the drums the distance of the instruments is absolutely nuts you got a duet with sinead o'connor or two um, I think duets with her, uh, it's such a fucking good record. I mean, yeah, kiss that frog sucks. Um, <laughs> and steam too. Like the two attempts at singles absolutely fall on their ass. This is like his disintegration, the cure. You know what I mean? Like this is his absolutely bleak, fucked up, heavy drinking record where he's just like, 
I mean, if you see pictures of him around this time, like when he's with Sinead O'Connor walking around at award shows and shit, he's like super puffy and wearing vests, that whole fucking move, like blouses and vests. Oh, it's so fucking good, man. I mean, he's such a knob. It's great. And he just, I mean, the guy's a fucking genius. I don't even know how to say it. Like, it's the biggest joke ever for a record geek to be talking about Peter Gabriel. But, I mean, the guy absolutely hit me in a way that, like, Nobody has. The song Mercy Street from So, to this day, is one of the only pieces of music ever that can make me remember what I felt like when I was like 13 or like 12. Like nothing can still make me feel or remember. There's very, very few songs that still work in that way. And he's got one of them. Uh, Woo. Oh, pop. Jesus. This record... Whew, this is really bad. I mean, just, there's not even a good song on this. It's so bad. I don't know if this is the worst U2 album. It's definitely in the running. Um, holy crap. That record is just such an absolute piece of shit. It's shocking. Um, I mean, it was, it's their amnesiac, essentially, like, I mean, because it's coming off Zuropa and it was leftover shit from Zuropa that they didn't finish. I mean, Numb and Lemon, Stay was a big hit. Um, I mean, you know, this album did okay, but it kind of sucked. And then they just had nothing and they crapped out pop and it was just atrocious. Yeah, it's a coaster. I mean, it's so bad. Passengers is worse. I mean, Passengers is really bad. Um... Yeah, and then, uh, yeah, you don't need me to talk about this. If you're interested in my opinions on wild mood swings, and I have many, uh, look up the Shallow Rewards podcast on Spotify. Shallow Rewards. That's the name I used to use for my blog back in the 2000s, and then I did some videos in the 2010s, early 2010s, before I left the internet. Um, and, and I still do, once in a while, put out a podcast on there, on Spotify and Apple Music, under that Shallow Rewards name. And I've been doing all the Cure albums. And the Wild Mood Swings one is really fun because, well, I mean, <laughs> some people have been upset by it. But I, like, totally go off on and take a crap on the album because it's indefensible garbage. Stone Free, I mention in the Wild Mood Swings uh, podcast because this has... Um, Robert's, like... Dr- I don't know why it says drums, Boris Williams. It's a fucking drum machine. Um... But this is when the, the band had broken up and like Perry is the only guy who's working with him because Simon's checked out and everybody's left. And he does this really, it's actually neat. It's just too long. There is a shorter single mix. I think it's on the Join the Dots, this version on the Cures Join the Dots box set of B-sides. But it's, it's, it's a cool idea and it's got cool loops and it's a cool, you know, vintage early 90s drum machine loop. But, um, you know, that's the rest of this. Man, you want to hear some early 90s pain. Whoo, yeah, this hurts. The Spin Doctor's version of Spanish Castle Magic. The Pretender's Bold as Love is good. And then you also got PM Don's Got Me Float. So PM Don had a great first... This is so embarrassing. Oh my God, bellies, are you experienced? But um, PM Don's first album uh, of the millennium or something, it's a crazy like consciousness hip-hop record with a... like you know, 80 word title, but they sampled, um, uh, Spandau Ballet. It's true. And they made this, this awesome dance pop classic with the, the Enigma beat or whatever you want to call it. Um, I forget which that is actually sampled from, you know, it's not the Amen break, but it's one of those famous, like, you know, it's the 16th hi-hat with an open. Anyway, PM Dawn were really cool for a minute, actually. I think they had, they had like two really strong singles on that first album. Uh, and then they just went, off on another planet living colors cross town tra- tra- traffic studio heads and and shredders will find something to love there a very technically tight band body counts hey joe is actually pretty fun too so anyway this is if you've never heard it for 250 i would get that that's great um reality used to be a friend of mine you know it um oh yeah yeah the 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 replacements goo goo dolls period so the goo goo dolls people don't know started out on metal blade records one of the cheesiest fucking labels ever and they were literally just a facsimile of the replacements but like cheesier and poppier so like uh there you are was the big hit on this um i mean i think literally in this video they're wearing like a a backwards baseball hat and all that shit um this record's but i'm kidding this record's not bad i mean it's the Goo Goo Dolls. So yeah, it's fluff. I mean, this is like at this time, you know, 
you, I would compare it, uh, I mean, whatever. Some people think mud honey is fantastic. Mud honey is like a dumber, sludgier, shittier version of the same impulse. Um, but the Goo Goo Dolls at this point, this is like, like you look back now on what's happened to Power Pop and what's happened to, you know, Pop Punk even. Like this record's on it. Like, I mean, honestly, all the people listening to, to new pop punk shit, um, you know, it's, this is exactly as cheesy as like the shit MGK is trying to do or whatever in his pop punk songs. Um, so I mean, yeah, four ninety nine. I mean, it's on metal blade. This is the other thing too. This is another one of those ones where like, I'm not sure how many copies of this there are. You think there's an infinite supply metal blade records wasn't pressing you know, 50, 75, a hundred thousand copies of this, I don't think. And a lot of CDs got thrown away and broken and just whatever. It was a disposable medium. So I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, look that in the mouth for five bucks. I'd probably take it down. I'd get it. Um, oh, there it is. The cursed Woodstock 94 comp. <sighs> ah, like <laughs> it's so weird. They have Bob Clear Mountain doing like on the original. It's ah, oh, it's so weird. You got Joe Cocker back to do feeling all right. Yeah, Super Muff is awesome. I love that. No, well, uh, Mud Honey once they got signed, everything got fucked up. Um, the label fucked with them. Every band says that. You know, oh, the label put pressure on us. We couldn't figure. We didn't know what to do. Get the fuck out of here. They just they couldn't write songs anymore. It happens to all of them. It happened to Screaming Trees. It happened to everyone out there. Um, this, I can't even imagine how bad this is. I've never heard it. Um, but, <laughs> I mean, it's live recordings of Woodstock 94. Right? All the fucking bands that were at this shithole. And, I mean, I wouldn't have gone near this with a 10-foot pole. I, I don't know. Is this version of Biko rousing in some way? I don't know. I mean, I'm not, I actually don't think Biko is, it, I think it's overcooked. I've never been a huge fan. Um but man, you know, Woodstock 94 <laughs> wasn't Woodstock 99, but it wasn't much better. Um, the artists were just rough. Um, there we go again. Cardigans, First Man on the Moon. Um, that's the total repeat offender. Take it down. Hey, there's Joshua Tree. You can get that with Unforgettable Fire. And you got like Peaky. And they have Octung too, even though it's the, the Jewel Case version. That's right there. Boom, boom, boom. You got the three strongest U2 albums all right in one store for nothing for 10 bucks you got unforgettable fire joshua tree and octung baby i mean done on physical rip it to flack done you've got it forever um robert plants now and then oh yeah so um little known fact potentially not little known potentially well known for the 20 people or whatever that are actually here already probably know this is the first cd i ever bought <laughs> this is the first cd i ever bought this, The Cures, The Top, and Living Colors uh, debut album, Vivid, were the first three CDs I got, uh, I think, for my birthday. Um, so the single on this is a great joke. So um, I don't even know how to point you to this. If you Google Top 500 Best Show or something, I uploaded this awesome bit Andrew Earls did for the Best Show on WFMU with Tom Sharpling. And it's a, it's, he's a radio jock that's making the top 500 songs for Memorial Day weekend. And I mean, I won't spoil the gag, but anyway, um, tall, cool one charts extraordinarily high in his list. And I mean, so this is like, this is a really awkward, hilarious thing. If you go look at the video for tall, cool one, Robert Plant is like, he's shirtless in a leather vest, like trying to get his machismo out there at whatever fucking age with this corny ass backing band. And it's got like, if there's any guitarists in here, man, the funniest, like learn to play guitar lick in the chorus of this. It's just the funniest two finger. It's just like A, 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 B, B, A. And then you move the same finger formation to the D and down and bend off. It's so funny. And I mean, when you listen to it now, it's incredibly painful. And the, the craziest thing is, there's a dance club 12 inch remix of tall, cool one that has a rap in the middle. Someone raps for like two minutes in the middle of tall, cool one. Um, but there's a, there's a really big ballad on here called ship of fools. And essentially this points the way to what Robert plant 
figured out how to do it, which was pair up with Alison Krauss and start writing some hardcore, you know, J crew rock. Um, it starts with manic Nirvana, this, but this was, this was an early kind of like, uh, window into something he didn't really solidify until significantly later. I got to figure out why all this weird stuff is showing up. I screwed up something in my filter because none of this should be showing up. I don't know why these, I'm going to have to look into it later. Anyway. Um, so yeah, ship of fools is this like super cheesy eighties ballad. Um, yeah. And that's the other thing that's really funny about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, nobody knows that. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, somebody was just calling out on the chat. Uh, this is Tony Halliday. Um, at this time she had just done a solo record called hearts and handshakes that had a song called, uh, um, it's, it's funny how time catches up with you something or other. It's so Alan Mulder did it. This is right before Alan Mulder becomes Mr. Cool and starts doing the Jesus and Mary Chains pop record automatic and gets all the shoegaze bands and all that shit. Like Tony Halliday was, a, was a major label property. She was in, she was, uh, Dave Stewart from the Eurythmics founder. Um, she got a huge deal with this band called state of play. I talk about this in the shoegaze videos I had done years and years ago. Again, shallow rewards was this thing. And I did these DSLR videos about shoegaze around 2012. And in it, I talk a lot about curve because curves first album was one of my favorites. And I talked about it even in the last stream, but Tony Halliday had been this cheesy in this really cheesy, awful, um, 1985 synth band called state of play. And then that totally fucking blew out. She tried a solo record that Alan Mulder had a heavy hand in. They end up getting married years later. And yeah, Kirstie McCall and her, she started doing a lot of background vocals and she appears on, um, on this. She's one of the backup singers, I believe on tall, cool one. So pretty, pretty interesting fact. It does not make that album any better. It's not a good album, but you know, it was the, one of the first CDs I ever owned. Uh, residence. Favorites. Oh. So, um, you know, this is late, late period residence, but residence fans are their own breed. I don't really go in for them. This is major landfill erasures chorus. This is just everywhere. Um, massively overproduced by, by mute and sire in the U S not one of their stronger albums. In my view, uh, I would not pick this up to be honest. Um, uh, fingerprints. I thought that was the, f it's the third album. Holy crap. Why did I think this was after Eskimo? Okay. My mistake. Um, so this is actually early, um, resonance, but again, it's like, what is early resonance They're It's on everything. They're different. Um, I, I was totally wrong about when this came out. Sorry. Um, this is obviously the reissue, but I just, it's, I, this whole thing is not for me. Like the resonance thing, it doesn't do it for me. Um, so, you know, but yeah, I mean, yeah, if, if that's, if that East side reissue was any good, this is, I mean, this is definitely late period <laughs> tangerine dream. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. So, uh, cyclone, um, you know, everybody has their favorite, you know, some people think it's eight. Some people think it's stratosphere, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, but by the time you're, you're getting up here, it, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's a weird one. It's, a uh, I don't, I don't have it. Um, I haven't, I haven't collected much tangerine dream physically, but, um, you know, it, it's from 78. It's the 10 year reissue on CD. You know, it's a lot of people think it's one of their stronger records for sure. Um, but stratosphere is the one for most people. Yeah, for sure. I like cyclone fine. Um, for three ninety nine, Yeah, I would probably get this. I mean, it's, you gotta, this is, this is like the big, long, chunky period. Like they've done, they've gone through and done like, you know, so much stuff to this point. They're getting very like mature in their whatever, um, approach to things. I mean, then they start doing thief and tan and, and fire starter and, and all this stuff and that I love, which is more kind of snack size, but this is maybe like the, you know, maybe it's force majeure. I don't think that one's that great, but this is like the, the sort of coda, right? When they do sorcerer, this is like the finale of their original 
sort of, you know, operatic approach. And, and this is an OG Virgin CD from 88, probably the first issue of it on CD. So you're going to have a good, um, you know, very mellow, um, mellow mastering job. The Bono Gavin Friday single. Oh boy. Yikes. Yeah. So when was Passengers? 96. It's just the, the after Octung Baby, man, it really goes off the rails for him. The Judgment Night soundtrack, Eternal. You are going to get, whoa, what? Wow. That's pretty cool. Six ninety nine. I mean, I don't give a crap about promo, not promo, whatever. This was interesting. This is the, when they got, you know, when Cobain made DGC reissue all the Raincoats records, they got back together and did this album and it's sealed six ninety nine. That's kind of cool. I'd take, I mean, it, it's not earth shattering. It's not, you know, <laughs> it's, it's not like Audie shape or, or the debut or even, you know, the one with like uh, no one's little girl, but, um, for six ninety nine, that's a take. But yeah, the Judgment Night soundtrack must two ninety nine is fine, especially if it's in good condition. Yeah, VG plus. Uh, this is a must. There's so many good, funny, but also legit great jams. Uh, so the joke here was rock band and rap, and rap artist. The just another victim. Helmet House of Pain is probably the best. Um, but I also love the Fallen. It's it's really really good. It's such a good blend of Daylaw and Teenage Fan. Like Teenage Fan Club's in there. They've got their like power pop sound in there right alongside Daylight. It's really, really good. Um, and there's a bunch of other hilarious shit on here, like the Sonic Youth Shredder, like, you know, noise peppered version of I Love You, Mary Jane. Um, not sure about Mud Honey and Sir Mix Lost Freak Mama, or this is a bummer because Del was, Del the Funky Homo Sapien was blown up good. Um, and then, yeah, I don't, so I don't even remember if the therapy one was any good because this is a weird period for therapy. Uh, but anyway, Biohazard and Onyx Judgment Night, that's fun. Onyx, not not an artist you hear much about anymore. Um, but for, yeah, for $2.99, this is like, this is The Crow, this, you know, there were a whole bunch of these soundtracks. This was the big thing coming out of the success, really, of Dazed and Confused, you know, selling classic rock to a new generation. All of a sudden, people were like, soundtracks are like a super good value prop to get people to buy you know, and get our artists promoted. It's a great promotional tool to get artists out there. And so Judgment Night was a, a legendary um, effort at this. And like the, the, the person who put it all together, um, uh, is it, was it Amanda or, I can't remember what, yeah, Boogie Nights. She did Boogie Nights. It was Karen and she's famous. She's one of the biggest music supervisors ever. This is, this is the record that like, totally made her she had done reservoir dogs and that was like hip because of the movie and that made her name but like this made it like holy shit she's enormous and then she just did everything reality bites pulp fiction like you name it she did it um yeah so she's one of the biggest music supervisors ever um and and she started the whole thing it was deeply partnered with tarantino from the word go but yeah this was this was the one that was like okay she didn't just do like a cool indie movie soundtrack she changed the fucking game like she changed the music industry's attitude for the rest of the 90s based totally on the success of judgment night it was nuts um so so 13 limited what is this 399 what is this enhanced box set limited edition numbered Fucking, I've never even seen this. <laughs> For $3.99, this is complete? Get it? I mean, Trim Trab's maybe my favorite. Not this. I like the live one where they go ape shit and it has the big explosion at the end. But there's so much good stuff on this. I mean, I you know, No Distance Left to Run is the big, you know, drama, emo. People love, you know, uh, Tender and, and Coffee and TV. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a total get for $3.99. It's in a limited paper shell box hell yeah get it there's the real cover that's a must don't need it because i got the blur box uh major repeat offender xtc's none such this album was so i've i have an, another call out to the podcast um i did uh i did a po two-part podcast on andy partridge and xtc well really xtc but because in the mid eighties, he goes sideways and sort of takes over the band. It's a lot about him inferences and, and psych one-on-one bullshit that I make assumptions about, about him. Um, but 
none such is this really horrific thing that the major like virgin just beat the shit out of this band they beat him to death and the problem is this album has like 19 tracks i mean it's stupid long 17 tracks and it, it's over an hour long like it's such a mistake because there are good songs in here um pr principally the 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 lead single the ballad of peter pumpkin peter Pumpkinhead, has one of the coolest drum productions of this time period it's a great xtc harmony chorus upbeat it's that jaunty xtc thing they do uh really recommend it there's other good stuff on here the disappointed rook is another sort of like mellow classic but it's just so goddamn long and the songs are all really long for the most part it's got a weird shorter period in the end but oh good we got raided hold on let me dump this porn bot in the chat we um yeah you literally can't even go on anything anymore without it happening um uh, i mean it's crazy was, there, was barely anybody watching we still got porn bots yay way to go youtube um but yeah i mean for 3.99 i honestly if you look around the singles from this i think the th I mean, Pumpkinhead and there's others, you can get them for like a dollar and they're good. They ended up on, you know, other, um, you know, comps or whatever. What the hell is this? <laughs> okay. I thought this might've been a, uh, television bootleg that they were trying to get, get under, but, uh, it's what looks to be an iconically, hilarious german goth band from 1992 um yeah way too much filler absolutely um don't worry about reporting the comments i just i ban them it's fine i i it's easy i just have to actually look over and notice it um uh the lonesome jubilee everybody knows i'm a big johnny stan but this album's not great paper and fire and cherry bomb is about it um you know the end of this album is really rough there, it's just way too farm aid. Like even though Scarecrow is the farm aid record, this one's a, it's just a little hoary and too too much with the Americana sauce. Rudy Two Toots okay, but like yeah, this is not one of his strongest records. Um, greatest hits, The Hoop. Come on, two ninety nine. You gotta all the young dudes, baby. And it's O three, so it's gonna be a remaster for the digital era. I mean, it's a cutout, but you know, my, the hoop is totally a singles band. You don't need any more than this. One of the boys in Sweet Jane on the bonus, done. Get it. You're fine. Get that. I mean, don't worry about it. Oh yeah, John Cougar was one of the people who started Farm Aid. This ridiculous bullshit in the mid '80s. Google it. Downward Spiral, Near Mint appears unplayed. Nice. The the uh, the mega Trent record. The the absolute goth 90s electronic goth uh masterpiece um you know i mean what, do you, what can you say like you, you get march of the pigs you get closer you got fucking hurt boom hurts so ridiculous man i can't believe this guy wrote something i could never have and hurt like i mean it's fucking sick look I, he can't he wasn't a good singer let's just get that out of the way trent reznor has never been a good singer. But man, when you talk about somebody who's just really mid in terms of their talent, actually just like powering through that shit and coming up with like such original material, I was never even a huge fan of the guy because I've told the story about it, Lollapalooza, what a prick he was and how he just his whole whiny whatever thing. It's just, I was a ministry person. Ministry was my shit you know, drugs, fuck yeah, man, crazy, out of control, guitar noise, turn it up, you know, thieves and liars, yeah, nihilism, this is so emo, Trent's always been so emo, and, and Pretty Hate Machine was like too drama club goth for me, even at the time, I loved Head Like a Hole, like, I, that song fucking slays, but I, I was a little on the fence, and still, I mean, to this day, it's never been a big record for me, but people who are like, you know, five years younger than me. I mean, I'm like last year of Gen X. Millennials that are, you know, older millennials, this is God shit. Like this, everything, like you just, you guys start crying when you fucking hear this. And I know you do. Um, the Broken EP is killer, yeah. Yeah, wish fucking rules. Um, 
Broken is goaded for sure. I've got two copies of it. <laughs> but I forgot. Like I, this is why I started adding stuff to my collection in Discogs. Because like three different times I bought something I already had, and I was just like, "You're out of your fucking mind. Get your shit together." Um, all right, I gotta. Like, we're, we're gonna try to keep this to an hour. Uh, oh my god, what creep? Wow, did not expect to see this. This was a flop sub pop thing. Um, what was the guy's name? Um, wow, this band like just died on their ass. They did one record with Sub Pop and just broke up. I don't even think he did anything else. Oh, he was in Swallow before this. That's what it was, uh, which is not the Shoegaze Swallow. There was this is a totally different band. Um, wow, that's funny. I mean, I just remember this because I was alive then and like it was Sub Pop and. Ugh, it's not. I don't think it's good. I, I'll listen to it later. It's probably like super boring, bad grunge. I don't know. Can I click the album cover? Yeah, sure. It's a doggo. You're a baby. You're a baby. But uh, yeah, this is 92, man. Sub Pop was not doing good. Um, Chris Pugh. Jean Magère, rendezvous. Jean Magère. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about another one we were talking about tangerine dream you can really uh, go back so yeah uh, people on the people who are in the discord i'm in know i found the omr of this that goes for like 200 plus bucks at a used store and uh i'm holding on to that shit. but yeah i actually have it I'm, it's it's one of the craziest probably highest ticket uh records i have is the uh the omr of of that record um anyway Oh my God! Guitar and Other Machines, not his best, but a really good record. Darudi Column, Vinnie Riley, one of my faves. So this is the period when he's writing, maybe, um, Morrissey's Viva Hate and working with Morrissey, and he does the Guitar and Other Machines at the same time. It's unfortunately, it's very noticeable that he's got too much going on. It's not one of his strongest records. Um, it's it's also the the venture version which is you really want these factory one, once reissues but they're getting to be hard to find i really don't know how many they pressed um but yeah you got a good you got a good you know you know we opened up we found a um we looked at an obscure record as an indicator or a record that's like in a wheelhouse that indicates the store is going to have the kind of stuff that you're looking for maybe um the toten holes and nice <laughs> uh Oh, Learning to Crawl, that's a must. Two ninety nine. dollars take that shit down. Middle of the Road and Back in the Chain Gang, are you kidding me? Time the Avenger um, and 2,000 Miles. I mean, this record is so solid. Um, that's an absolute must. Oof. $2.99 for the Sire CD of that. Yeah, you got a bag out of here. Missing. <laughs> Everything but the girls missing comes up a lot. Pearl Jam's Versus. That's, oof. Don't call me Dunner. Uh, this is this record sucks. The first song, Go, I was actually like, oh man, wow, they're they're coming out hot. Like they want to tighten it up and dump all that dump all that reverb and and shit off the first album. And this might not be it. Nope, sucks. <laughs> like I got past the first song and I was like, this is awful. It goes, oh shit, done. Get it in your bag. This is the absolute. You have to have this. You have to have Mania. This is the record that got everybody my age into the Ramones. They were so fucking not cool. You were seeing them on, um, you know, you, you were, you were seeing them doing the, you know, the Pet Cemetery soundtrack. The Ramones were like a goof. They were like not taken seriously. And cause we didn't have the old records. They weren't out. They weren't like getting promoted. So they did this big comp and it's just, man, it's 30 fucking perfection songs of perfection all in a row. Like for somebody my age, this is probably how you heard the Ramones. And like, you expect to hear Teenage Lobotomy after I Want to Be Sedated. You expect to hear, you know, I Want to Live after Sheen is a Punk Rocker because of this record. It's just, it's totally iconic. And maybe that won't mean anything if you're not, you know, sort of like older Gen X or from my, my era. But $4.99, you know, if you don't have a big Ramones collection, get in on that. Paying more than a dollar for songs of faith and devotion is questionable. Same with the Immaculate Collection, but those are both buys. Cranberries, I mean, give me a break. That's that's ridiculous. Bonzo goes to Bitburg, you bet. Song actually shreds. Ooh, there's a good one. That's interesting. I'd, I'd take that down. So this is a compilation that they put out when they signed 
um, Morphine from Boston. So Dream, this is one of the first DreamWorks record signings, if I'm not wrong, if I'm remembering this right. Morphine was one of the first bands on DreamWorks records. And this is a sample with like all the great shit um, from Good, Cure for Pain, and, and uh, Yes, which were on Ryko. Um, you got Thursday, In Spite of Me, that beautiful ballad, Have a Lucky Day. I, I love this band. I mean, it's it sucks that he died um, relatively young. Um, I, these guys were great. I just, they're, they're such an original, cool, you know, head band in so many ways, you know, morphine and, and like cum was around at that time in Boston. Um, bands that were really playing with like dirty, dark blues stuff and like, you know, drug, uh, shit, but it, you know, really cool musical stuff, not just like, you know, goth or whatever. Um, yeah, well, this, I mean, we didn't get all the way through the store. I didn't A to Z it because realizing in the first stream, A to Zing is like not really lending itself to a diversity of commentary. Just took it down random. You are the quarry. Yeah, nice. Um, yeah, so we'll end. Oh, shit. The cult's electric. Uh, aphrodisiac jacket. It's not a great record, but love removal machine and aphrodisiac jacket are absolute fucking bombs. And their cover of Born to be Wild is not bad. It's really not. This this album's great. It's not the one, but it's still good. Um, man, you gotta get that. What noise? I don't know. Did I accidentally hit the thing? Did I accidentally hit the, the stream deck thing? Oh well. All right, well, it's it's uh, we're after eight o'clock. Oh, there's Culture Club's Color by Numbers. Get it. I don't want to. I don't want to stuff too much in one stream. We got to say I'll talk about these records in other streams. Um, I groaned. <laughs> okay, whatever. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, we're gonna shut this one down, box it, just a straight up shop for an hour, and uh, and we're done. And so it's gonna be Thursdays seven o'clock Eastern Time U.S. and Sundays two o'clock. That's the idea. End it on war to bring it circle with you too. No, no, no. We'll get into that later. You know what I'm saying? You old fucking jug. Um, so anyway, <laughs> we'll see you. Uh, we'll see you Sunday too, um, and we'll get into it uh, again. All right. So I'm gonna shut this stream down, um, and that'll be that. Thursday. It's. I'm. It says it in the thing. Thursdays at seven at night at Eastern, and Sundays at two. I'm not fucking on heroin. Okay. Uh, do I stop the stream?